Thank you very much, uh, John Sweeney, for accepting our invite and uh, giving uh, us your time. Uh, today we are going to talk about climate crisis and uh, what, uh, how do we anticipate it, uh, what is the role of future literacy, and I will begin by uh, asking you to tell us a little bit about why do we need future literacy for anticipating climate crisis, for instance. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually. Of course, I wish I could be with you in person, and I hope that opportunity presents itself in the future. I suppose that the biggest thing that I can see with regards to the climate crisis and futures literacy is that the climate crisis has, for many people, uh, taken away the future. So we feel as if that actually the future is already determined or there won't be a future. And there's that sense that the future has been either limited or if not erased for many relative to what we're hearing about, of course, the realities of a climate changed world. So I think more than ever, what futures literacy can do is help us to make sense of what we're seeing and how we're seeing it. And I think specifically the challenge of futures literacy is to continue to have to try to find ways to ensure that we are honest with ourselves about what we see and really to assess our own sense of agency. Not agency in the sense that we have complete control, of course, over creating the future, but how can we shape the future? What actions can we take? <clears throat> what even is preferable in light of, of course, the, the climate crisis and all the challenges that uh, it's going to bring with it? And so I think actually it's, it's an opportunity for us to reimagine how the future uh, can and might be. And of course, that starts with ourselves. And I think that's where futures literacy has a lot of value as an approach. Uh, right now, Pakistan ha has had a flood, and it was unprecedented. Uh, we have, although we have had another flood 12 years ago in 2000, uh, 2010, uh, but this is even larger, and this one is supposedly climate-driven. So uh, in this uh, situation, people who are affected by it, they have lost their lives, they have lost their property, they have lost their uh, livestock and they have no shelter, they have no food, uh, they don't even have any medicine. How does future literacy uh, help them? How would it help those people in that kind of condition? And when you talk about agency, uh, what kind of agency do you think they have? And how would future literacy or anticipation help them? Well, certainly I think it's worth stating that futures literacy is no substitute for the basics of humanitarian aid. And so of course, you know, people need to have a safe place to, to sleep. They need to have comfort for their families and, and food and, and the basic necessities. And so I think futures literacy only works when those necessities are, are available. I do think, however, that there is an opportunity to help people try to understand and make sense of possibilities for what might lie ahead. But again, I think that only happens when, when people are provided the, the basics. I think broadly speaking, and this is what I've seen, of course, not being in Pakistan, that Futures literacy can help us try to imagine the futures that we're not seeing. And so I think a lot of people around the world uh, are not seeing the, the, the scale of the crisis in Pakistan. I think if people were to understand and make sense of that in a, in a more dynamic way, and I think futures literacy can do that, then I think the, the scale of the response, I think, would be quite different. Uh, I think it's almost difficult, if not impossible, for people to imagine uh, what exactly has been happening. And I think where futures literacy also has value is that, of course, there is the initial crisis where it's the it's the people being displaced. But then we're talking about the breakdown of different types of systems, whether it's food systems or educational systems or, of course, you know, health systems in crisis dealing with you know waterborne disease. And so I think this is where futures as an approach can be useful. It's not just often the first order impact, but those second or third order impacts that can be the, the most lasting and in some ways uh, the most harmful. So I think this is where futures literacy can bring a lot of value is trying to help others on the outside be more aware and, and, and make sense of what those futures could be. And then, of course, to respond appropriately, but internally also to help people think about uh, how to move forward again, once those basic necessities have been met. So how would this experience of Pakistan in this climate driven uh, crisis would help others around the, around the world to anticipate climate crisis and prepare for it? Well, of course, you know, one would hope that we actually create the space to learn from and to try to then be able to respond appropriately to future crises. 
I think, unfortunately, our track record is not so good. So I think then what becomes most operative is how do we find ways to ensure that we're continuously exploring this possibility space? And I think now more than ever, what we need to do is, is of course, let go of the just the projected future or the, the plausible or the probable future. I think increasingly, as you note, that we're dealing with these once in a century, once in a millennia events uh, more and more frequently. So the categories that we use to actually make sense of the future need to shift. And one thing that climate change, of course, is doing, and I think a real lesson is to be able to understand and make sense of how we can't just latch on to a particular perspective on the future. And so, you know, my hope would be that the world could look to Pakistan and understand and make sense of what it is going through still, again, given the, you know, the second and third order effects of the crisis, and use that as a way to, to create some learning and move forward. I mean, we see this, of course, in uh, what's been happening in the context where I work in Uzbekistan as well with the Aral Sea crisis. Uh, but it's, of course, a challenge because we're we're really kind of have this neurological, biological bias where it's difficult for us to assess and make and make sense of, you know, the types of scale of changes that we're actually confronting. Uh, what is future literacy? If you could tell us uh, a little bit for our audience, what is future literacy? What is probable future? What is plausible future? These are the terminologies you have used. And uh, I would really appreciate if you could explain that a little bit for our, uh, for our audience. Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, futures literacy is really a capability. It's the means to understand and make sense of how the future as a, as a force, as imaginaries, as, as the kinds of things that shape how we think and feel, not only about the future, but about today. Uh, it's about how we engage with that. So it isn't just about imagining scenarios. It isn't just about uh, creating, you know, and using different, you know, future studies tools. It's about trying to make sense of how we are using uh, and really trying to deploy certain anticipatory assumptions. So how is it that we're thinking and feeling about the future? And how does that shape what we think is possible in the here and now? Now, oftentimes, futures literacy is deployed through the sort of lab, uh, which is a, a multi-step framework. And initially, and what I find most valuable about the Futures Literacy Lab and, and the sort of knowledge laboratory framework is that we actually first start with that projected or that probable future. The future that we really expect, the future that we anticipate the most, or the future that we think is the most likely. And the reason to do that is not because that's actually correct, but to kind of get that out into the open, because that's the primary space with which our assumptions about the future lie, the future that we really think is going to actually come about. And so that S on futures literacy is quite important because it does start from the premise that there are multiple futures that are in fact possible, but we start actually with what we expect, with what we think is probable or what we think is plausible or projected. Then we go to the second stage, which is attempting to reframe our future, which actually is a constructed or a crafted either story or experience. Sometimes we use games or simulations to be able to shift that thinking. And that's directly based on the assumptions. So futures literacy is actually a sort of a dynamic or an action learning approach that is responsive. And so after that experience where we have entered into a radically different future, then we move to the next stage, which is all about new questions or new ways of understanding and making sense of the future. So as we've come out of that experience, then we have the opportunity to say, okay, what has really changed for me? What do I think about the future now? How do I make sense of the future differently? And then in the final step, which is, again, not always part of the process, it depends on the specific engagement, we would say, okay, what's our action? What's our policy? What's our plan? So it's only after we've gone through that process <clears throat> that we even begin to think about actually crafting <clears throat> some type of action or some way of moving forward. So uh, uh, we have to create a design, a future literacy lab uh, for uh, uh, focused on climate crisis. If you could give us some suggestions of what techniques to use or how to uh, design this future literacy lab, I'll appreciate it. Well, the first principle that I think is most important and one that I think has a lot of value is to focus on co-design. Uh, I think when the, the lab framework began, one thing that um, Riel and the team, when, when, he, when Riel was at UNESCO and they were really bringing it forward, was to actually engage with your stakeholders, with your partners, 
to try to create a process so that they're learning about the process. And of course, not everyone need be part of that design, but the idea is you get, you know, at least some of the organizers involved in that. Of course, the participants, again, some of them possibly engaged, but, but some of them need not. But the idea is that it's not just something that's designed for a group, but designed with uh, a set of other you know, partners or organizers or even participants. And I think the value there is people have a greater sense of ownership and engagement throughout. I think that's quite critical. I think on the, the second is, and of course, this is what I also find really dynamic and engaging and useful about the Futures Literacy Lab is that it says that we don't just need an imagination, but we need an ethical imagination. So how do we stage and create a reframe, how to in that second phase when we're trying to really take the future and turn it, how do we do it in a way that is not alienating or is not just shocking people, but trying to actually create that critical and creative imagination. And so I think that does require a bit of testing. I think it does require a, a real careful consideration of, of course, sometimes the trauma that people have been through in the present and how we don't want to repeat that with our exploration of the future. But we do want to, of course, stretch uh, the thinking as much as possible. And so I think that's really more of, a, of an art than a science. There's a, there's a delicate sort of dance that has to happen with reframing those assumptions about the future. And I think to the first point, that really can come about if we have a strong relationship and a strong principle of co-design as part of the process. I think also, too, for the, the, the last thing I'll mention in the third phase is to really let people focus on uh, creating questions that they think are going to lead to action or questions that are going to be about sort of different levels, right? So maybe there's a, a set of questions about individuals. What, what is this person going to do? What does this person think? And then there's community and organization. Because sometimes it's really easy to go up a level and get lost at the national level, or organizational level without bringing it back down to the person. Um, what does this person think? What can this person do? And how does that emerge out of the process as well? Uh, you uh, said that uh, when we are creating a future literacy lab uh, one is co-design we have to uh, take into consideration the participants or the stakeholders and uh, so that they have ownership of that design you also said that we have to include the ethical dimension which is very important uh, tell us a little bit more about it for instance if i'm using a sustainable development goals of united nations is that a framework that we can use in order to co-create our future literacy lab? Sure, that's a that's a great framework because it's quite broad in how people are, again, trying to construct and make sense of the future. And I could see you could use it in a few different ways. I think really what I what I'm trying to kind of frame with the ethical imagination is that we need to be able to think about a reframe and questions that come out of it that are not just about you know, one particular uh, lens on the future, one particular perspective, but can really benefit sort of social good more broadly. And so I could imagine that actually one thing you could do that'd be quite interesting is maybe actually use the sustainable development goals on the front and the back. So they possibly could come in when you're exploring the, the, the probable or the projected, which are the goals that we think are you know, most achievable, which are the goals that we think are not, right? And they could be the lens with which you explore those futures. And then certainly on the back end with the questions, you know, you could have questions in relation to goals or even at the target level, you know, relative to what you think is, uh, you know, is is going to be uh, ultimately helpful for them to explore the future further. So I think that could be a really clear way to sort of bring it in and to have that sort of ethical imagination come forward. Uh, that brings me to uh, emerging trends and uh, uh, mega trends. And how, how do you identify weak signals of change or strong signals of change? emerging issues, emerging trend, mega trend. Uh, 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 if you could uh, explain th these a little bit, that would really uh, be helpful. Yeah, well, <clears throat> there's lots of terms that you sometimes people use like strong signals, weak signals, yeah. uh, mega trend, right? Being sort of the, the most global in scope, uh, affecting different contexts, of course, in, in different ways. And then sometimes we have trends that, you know, global, uh, you know, regional, national, local levels. Sometimes we use emerging issues. Some people use the term wild cards or uh, even weak signals. Again, I, I typically stay away from wild cards as a term. I think really there's, there's sort of two broader categories, as you noted, sort of strong signals and weak signals. Uh, I often, of course, you know, do scanning as a process. So I have my own scanning practice where I'm looking at, of course, news sources, but I'm also looking uh, at different patents. 
Uh, I read the, the the weird news in the newspaper, right? The odd articles sometimes to try to catch those uh, weaker signals, those emerging issues. And I think most importantly, what I do is I try to also participate in global communities. So that way I'm not just hear, hearing or seeing news or trying to make sense of information from my perspective, but to try to broaden my, my way or making sense of the future. And of course, you know, I also try to make sure that I'm checking my own assumptions when I see something. Uh, so if I see something that possibly I think I brush off or I think it's not important, I try to look and understand how people are seeing it and making sense of it. So for me, it's actually a very uh, dynamic and, and sort of learning process. I, I actually do it sort of quite manually. Uh, there are some interesting platforms that are available for this as well that help to collate and bring information together, help to curate. So there's there's lots of ways to be able to do this. The reason I still think there's a lot of value in doing it sort of, you know, by paper with, if you will, not that I actually do it by paper, but in collecting bookmarks and tagging things and trying to have it together is I find that I actually am building different perspectives or, or ways of making sense of the future as I'm doing it. So sometimes even weeks later, if I'm on a project, I'll remember, oh, there was that issue that I saw or I spotted back then uh, that could be value, that could be a value here. So I think there's a lot of value in building a practice of scanning. Uh, I scan in the mornings. I typically scan if I have a little break after lunch, and then I'll do it sometime in the evening as well. Of course, if I'm traveling or if I have spare time, I can engage with different platforms to be able to do that. Uh, social media is great, as I mentioned, also scanning news sources and then engaging with different communities, I think really helps me in trying to uh, both track those stronger signals and also to spot those those weaker signals. Uh, we have also uh, uh, we also talk about uh, not using used future. Uh, what is used future? How does that used future colonize us? And how do we decolonize that used future? Well, this is, I think, one of the critical challenges that we have today in that we see quite a lot of the power of used futures. And certainly when you mention the sustainable development goals and, and having worked quite a lot in the humanitarian and development space, the, the clearest example that I can see is that we talk about development or we talk about progress in certain kinds of ways. Uh, I think one of the, the biggest used futures that's out there is the idea of gross domestic product. So GDP, we measure all countries according to this kind of marker, and we say this is your value as a as a country relative to this. And of course, as we know, that's that's it's quite destructive or even quite absurd as a way to measure uh, the kind of benefit uh, that that countries bring to to the world as a whole. And of course, arguably, we could say that this is in and of itself the 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 cause of the of the climate crisis, right? A certain way of seeing and making sense of the world, and so. I think we we have to break out of these used futures. And part of that is seeing, uh, again, a way beyond GDP, a way beyond growth, uh, you know, sort of getting us out of this kind of short term uh, present centric mode of thought and really allowing us to challenge those those assumptions that have taken hold about about what what progress is, about what growth is, about how different cultures and different contexts, you know, create benefit not only for themselves, but but for the world as a whole. And so I think, you know, there there's different ways of thinking about this. I think ultimately, of course, that the idea of decolonization refers to the specific process by which communities then not only try to, you know, recover from uh, colonialism, but also to try to combat neocolonialism. And that's a very sort of contextual and a very territory specific type of engagement. I think the metaphor of colonizing the future, of course, can be quite problematic because we don't just want to equate it with that. But as you noted, and I, I do agree, the future is colonized in our minds. In other words, it literally is something that is is taken over and territory is is made and gained by these different types of futures that that literally can infect us and, and create different ways of seeing and making sense of the future. And so I do think we have to undergo this decolonizing process uh, again as a metaphor mentally. And I think futures literacy is one of the ways that we can do that. I do think the challenge, as we noted before, is that we need to have the basic necessities. Uh, I love this phrase that, you know, freedom really starts at breakfast. If people are able to start the day with basic necessities and needs, then then we can begin to be free to be able to, to do the other things that we need to do, such as imagining a better future for us all.
Uh, that brings me to uh, another question about Futures Literacy Lab. So if we are trying to elicit participants' futures story, how do we do that? So I think what's really quite interesting is that there, there is a way to really try to help people come out and to, to share their stories about the future, which, which is not something that is actually always, always natural. I mean, if we think about it, actually, and one thing that I'm always surprised by is when people reflect on the process, one thing they say quite a lot is, you know, no one had actually ever asked me about the future before. We just do everything now and we talk about planning or this or that. But to stop and think about the future uh, often seems quite quite different or, again, quite unnatural to people. So I think one of the things to do is to at the very early stages with participants is to really to, to hold that and talk about that a bit. You know, we we talk and think about the future all the time, and yet we rarely stop to think about how we think about the future. And that's really, I think, the value of, of the lab approach. And so I often at the front end try to do even icebreaker activities that help people reflect on that and to try to bring that out. And so one of the earlier things that I might do is say, okay, let's let's put in the chat, you know, uh, a certain, you know, when, we th when we think about the future, uh, what's the time that we think of? And some might say five years or 100 years or 20 years. And we can use that as a starting point for saying, actually, look, we see and make sense of the future quite differently. And I think uh, anything that can help people feel safe and comfortable and try to hold that space of saying, you know, we all think about the future in different ways, and that's a good thing. And yet we want to be on a journey together to explore the future. I think that connectedness really helps. So early on, as much as possible, to try to share that sense that we all imagine the future, we all have assumptions, and this is really a safe space to be able to explore that, while also really having consent from people to be able to say that we are going to stretch our thinking. So we might encounter provocations that make us, you know, uncomfortable or that we might have to, uh, you know, deal with some of these, you know, implications of and to do that again in a critical and creative way. And how do you uh, identify their uh, assumptions uh, of their future expected future stories? So I think most of the time I try to ensure that we we let people engage the future uh, on their own terms, you know, using a tool that can help them really come to a clear understanding of what those assumptions are, because it's not just that we don't even talk about those assumptions, right? They need to be moved uh, from being very hidden or implicit to being explicit, is that sometimes we're not even sure what they are. They're, they're so deeply rooted in, in, in just uh, the way that we see things that we don't even realize the lens that we're looking through. So this is where a tool like causal layered analysis is really helpful, uh, moving us from a, a kind of a top layer understanding, what's the news stories, what are the headlines, helping us understand at the second layer level, the systems, and underneath that, the kind of worldview, the values. And then finally, is there a, a story or a saying? Is there a myth or a metaphor that's really capturing how we see how we see and make sense of the future? And so I think CLA has proven to be a really powerful tool for helping people get to those assumptions, helping them see those assumptions, and then starting to, as, as we've been discussing, help to kind of uh, you know, deal with those used futures and to help to decolonize the way that we, we might think about the future. And once uh, you have uh, elicited the expected future story of the participant, and you have identified uh, their assumptions, how would you reframe? Uh, what would you do to help them reframe? So I'm really partial to processes of, of discovery and, and really processes that provide some of the pieces, but people also have to engage with it. So, you know, one tool that's quite quite popular, of course, is scenarios. And scenarios are great because you can put people into a certain situation. I really also love games and simulations because then people have to be part of the process. So I really like to use uh, anything that is participatory, anything that's engaging people to actually uh, you know, come forward and give their own perspective and view. So I often try to stage and create simulations that use role play. Uh, sometimes we utilize Again, different tools like the thing from the future. So people will create an object from the future. Uh, so what we would do is we would listen to the assumptions. Uh, 
the kind of co-design team would say, okay, let's use this particular uh, you know, game or simulation. Let's take those assumptions and we literally turn them 180 degrees and then we put people into that, into that experience, into that process. Of course, it has to be guided. So strong facilitation, of course, is always a, a benefit and to really ensure that people are able to do that in a safe and a productive way and that they're, they're part of the process. I think you know, one of the challenges is always we're competing with other visions or images of the future out there. So how do we give them futures that are, are relative to their assumptions, but also not just a used future, right? And I think that's one of the challenges of today is we're, we're bombarded by all these images of the future that we need to be able to create spaces for people to also help to explore and give voice to that during that critical reframe process. And that this brings me to the last question that I have for you. And uh, that is about the role of imagination in futures literacy and anticipation. Uh, what, what is the function of imagination in it? Well, there's no, uh, there's no actual futures literacy without imagination. And I think, you know, we, we can talk about how we might imagine the future uh, through different types of, uh, you know, quantitative measures or methods, but really at the heart of futures literacy is the the basic premise that you know we all have the power to imagine the future uh, in different ways and so futures literacy is about really trying to strengthen that as a as a capability as a skill so that we know how we're seeing the future how we're using the future the futures that are around us um, you know who do those futures belong to what are the futures we're not seeing uh, there's a lot of interest now, of course, in imagination as a as a critical skill, as a capability and curiosity and creativity. And I think futures literacy is one of the, the essential means by how we can really strengthen that. I think more than ever that what, what is really necessary to go back to this earlier point is that imagination isn't just enough. We need this ethical imagination. We need to be able to imagine possibilities uh, that are really for the betterment of, of, of course, a particular community or a society or a nation, of course, or at large. And I think that it really is essential that we do try to utilize as many different tools or approaches as possible. And futures literacy and the lab approach has certainly been, I think, a, a really dynamic way to be able to do that. Thank you so much, John, uh, for taking your time out. I really appreciate this discussion. It would help all of my participants and the audience understand and make sense of future literacy, anticipation, how to look, how to scan for emerging trends, how to create a future literacy lab. I really appreciate you always cooperated with us. You always uh, talked to us and we really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations on the conference and I look forward to doing the next one in person. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Take care now.